Hello, everyone. My name is Rudy Kerr. I work with Bridges Navigator, working with deaf and hard of hearing people all over the state of Alaska. Today we'll be talking about how to understand working with deaf people, hard of hearing, and people with hearing loss in their various cultures. What is Bridges Navigator? We help navigate people, getting them in touch with different agencies, with statewide, all over Alaska. We work with health and social services. We help people get in touch with uh, mental health um, resources if they need to. And that's very hard for deaf and hard of hearing people in the state of Alaska to set up um, get them into the agencies they need to, and then also set up sign language interpreting services. Um, Social Security is another place we help, getting people to connect with, so getting into SSI or SSDI. Um, we facilitate communication in those kind of situations. Um, we work with job centers and the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation. Um, we, our job is to help communicate get them to the places they need to be and make that a very smooth transition. Um, that is very difficult all over the state of Alaska, um, but this is our main focus. We provide advocacy also. We also want to get people into Cook Inlet tribal housing, um, drug rehab sources through Cook Inlet. Um, again, we facilitate communication, just helping people um, navigate through a busy, could be a complicated system. Um, educational services will help with. We help students who are in high school, who are deaf or hard of hearing, helping them make the transition into the working life or college life after they're graduating out of the school. Um, we want students to have the technical services they need out in the villages, um, we can connect them with those kind of resources also. We provide trainings. Um, um, today we're doing one of our trainings here today which is given free of charge um, where we talk about deaf and hard of hearing needs, how to work with deaf and hard of hearing people in your work environment. We provide free public access to video phones. Um, uh, is video phone is a face-to-face -face communication through the internet um, where we use, where deaf people can use their first language, sign language. Um, they can make place any kind of call, a business call, a call to a lawyer, a call for pizza. Um, used people, deaf people used to use TTYs, a teletypewriter machine where we would have to type it in English and another person would have to you have the same machine to communicate. TTYs are not used very well, um, very often right now. Um, another resource we use for telephone is a CapTel telephone for someone who's maybe um, has lost their hearing later in life but is still able to speak very clearly, you can place a phone call um, but that phone call goes through a third party where an operator will type out um, and it comes across a screen on your telephone of what the other person is saying and you're still able to speak. Um, we use, we have computers available for people to look for housing, for resources they need. And um, in the community, we also have a CTV, um, which helps a deaf, blind, or person with severe hearing loss. Um, these can uh, expand um, uh, reading materials so it's able to be seen visually. It's a great technology that works very well for many people in the community. We also go out to the villages and we uh, network out there. We advertise our program to them. 
often will meet with deaf and hard of hearing people who are out in the villages. Um, we'll sit down and talk and see what we can do to improve ser services in their rural, in their rural areas. Um, we also give speeches in their towns or in their villages. Um, um, we do this four, three, maybe four times a year. We'll go out into the villages and provide those kind of services. The walk of life. A deaf and hard of hearing person, how do they get through life in general? Next slide. The age of onset. When a deaf person becomes deaf, are they born deaf as they grow up? Are they losing their hearing? Or as they get into their senior years, do they lose their hearing? There's a wide variety of times you can be deaf. If you were born deaf, it's nothing to it. it you're used to it. At age one or two and you start losing your hearing, um, it, it can affect the person somewhat. But as you get older, and you lose your hearing, it's a scary experience to, be, to lose your hearing and to become really deaf. Um, when a child is born, um, it could be the cochlea inside of the ear is damaged. It could be nerve damage that causes hearing loss. And the connections between the cochlea and the brain, um, if there's anything broken down or missing in there, it could damage it in the cochlea. If you have hairs that don't work or are broken in there, you have a hearing loss. And for me, um, I, my deafness is because of nerve damage. Um, I, that's, I was born this way, I grew up this way, it runs through my family, it's genetic, it is passed on as a recessive trait. Um, noise is a big factor that can cause um, hearing loss. Um, the president of Gallaudet University, the first deaf president ever at Gallaudet, um, he, for, and Gallaudet University is the only university in the world for deaf and hard of hearing people. The president was in his 20s, he was in a motorcycle accident, and he lost his hearing. Other people can lose their hearing through sound. Um, high frequency sounds can cause deafness. Um, if someone is born with a slight hearing loss and they already are listening to very loud music or they have their headphones on high or their TV up too loud, um, this could to make a uh, hearing loss that would further their hearing loss later on in life. So it is possible to make that. Okay. Diseases um, can cause hearing loss. Often in the 60s and 70s, there was a time in there where there was an outbreak of the German measles. So the German measles. Um, was, there was a heart uh, rubella was another word for it. If the mother got the German measles in the first or second term of pregnancy, the child could be born deaf, could be born blind, or be born with a uh, mental loss. This was a huge epidemic, like into the 70s, and rubella was just a large epidemic. Many, that was a big cause of hearing loss for people of that time. And then hereditarily, this happens in my family. My parents are deaf, my sister is deaf, um, many of my relatives are deaf. Um, don't know where it started or how it started, but we know it is genetic. Uh, there's another, there's Wurlberg syndrome is another thing. And you will notice a deaf person with white up in front and a white mustache. Um, that is a genetic sign. High percentage of those people will have severe hearing loss or deafness. As you get older, many people, uh, grandfathers, grandmothers, they'll start to lose their hearing. And uh, happens to many relatives out there, you lose your hearing as you get older. And it's a difficult thing to realize you're missing so much. Some people will use hearing aids 
to help them hear better. And other people's like, oh, I don't need a hearing aid. And you can see that it's there's so it can happen and it does happen to many people in the aging. Levels of hearing. There are different where someone can hear perfectly until someone can hear nothing. Again, there's a wide range of hearing or a hearing loss that you can have. Normal hearing, you're able to hear and speak clearly. You have no difficulties at all. Maybe you'll lose a little as you get a little bit over. That's between 15 decibels and stuff. And they've, they've, they've made different levels of hearing loss that the audiologists use and they use the decibel system. So when they do their audiogram, they do, they look at different frequencies, low to high frequencies. And the test, when they're giving those and you hear the sound, that frequency, you raise your hand and they're marking that frequency level. The average hearing loss, though they can count count they can calculate and figure out normal hearing they would say 15 decibels is uh, you're still if you have that much of a hearing loss you're doing okay you're missing some of the low frequencies but you're still considered normal hearing with a 15 decibel loss a mild hearing loss oh let me look at my numbers here Um, 16 to 25 decibel loss. It's just a mild thing. You're still able to speak clearly, hear a little bit muffled. If we go next slide. A moderate hearing loss. And that's where you start struggling a little bit more communicating with people. You're misunderstanding, you're missing things. And that is a 41 to 55 decibel loss and it's starting to have a little bit harder time communicating. You're having to lip read a little bit more or possibly starting to think about using a hearing aid. Sometimes it'll help, sometimes it won't. Moderate to severe hearing loss. Um, those decibel levels are 56 to 70. This is more severe. This is where um, you're really struggling and uh, background noises will really interrupt your hearing. Um, hearing aids might help. Um, and then severe hearing loss, that's 81 to 90 decibel loss. You're trying to use a hearing aid or you might use nothing. You might have to lip read. You might have to go to pen and paper at that time. And then with profound hearing loss, 91 and above the decibel loss there. Um, you can hear a jet airplane going over. Very loud sounds is the decibels you'll be uh, able to hear. And that is what we call profound hearing loss. So you don't hear very much. With the severe hearing loss, um, um, hearing high voices is rather difficult. High pitches. Uh, is very tough to catch. Um, you'll pretty much be going with pen and paper or doing um, lip reading skills to try and understand. Again. Now to communicate, different communication methods. It kind of depends on the individual. Um, if you're able to lip read, able to speak very well, that's the way you're gonna go. If it works for you, use it. Um, other people's that does not work, um, some people will depend on American Sign Language to communicate with, um, or other people have the option of, if they run into a person and they're able to lip read them and they can try and get by, remember lip reading is a very high skill. You can only get 20 to 30% of what somebody says off of their lips. Other times you have to fill in what they're trying to say. And if it works for you, that's great. Pen and paper work every time for many people. People are a little bit scared to get in, uh, work with pen and paper and well, I just need an interpreter. 
um, to use. You can use an interpreter in situations like job interviews and such like that, but pen and paper seem to work every time for communication. Next slide. Cultural identity. Um, people identify themselves, identify themselves in different ways. People say, I'm deaf, or people say, I'm very deaf. Other uh, end of the spectrum will say, well, I'm more hard of hearing, and it's okay. People identify themselves, or I have a hearing loss, or other people will be in complete denial. I was like, I hear, I'm here fine, you know. So there's different ways you can identify yourself in there, and people do that in many different ways. Um, we're talking about deaf versus deaf. Capital D, there's little case D. The capital D is we, someone who uses American Sign Language. They were born deaf. They went to school for the deaf. Maybe someone in their family is deaf. They hang out with deaf people in deaf clubs, and they follow all the norms and cultures of a deaf person using American Sign Language. A little d, deaf, lowercase. This is more a clinically... Um, diagnosed person deaf. The doctor says you have a hearing loss, but they don't hang out in the deaf world. They don't use sign language. They don't follow the norms and cultures of the deaf people who are the capital D deaf. Some people are very skilled to go back and forth. Um, I, I'm easy to go back and forth with people. You know how I do it? I do it with pen and paper. It works very well. Other people will call themselves hard of hearing. Sometimes you're stuck in the middle of two worlds. It's a difficult place to be. You're not in the deaf world. You're not in the hearing world. Um, you're able, some people, they're able to speak still, so they go into there and then they know sign language and you can go into the deaf world. Um, some of those people will go into themselves. So some people who are hard of hearing will say, Forget it, I'm just gonna immerse myself in the deaf world, go to the schools. Other people can ride the middle of the fence and do very well. Late deafened. Sometimes after your 20s, you start to have hearing loss and then you realize it's gone. Maybe in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, your hearing really can digress. Um, sometimes they'll use hearing aids but a lot of older adults have a hard time with using a hearing aid and they kind of stay in denial and don't recognize that they do have a hearing loss. Now, another one is deaf blind. If you're born blind and deaf and blind, whew, there's a lot to learn. You have to learn sign language and learn it tactically, kind of like Helen Keller. Um, you have to learn to read braille to communicate, it is a challenge. Some people will grow up with their uh, um, having normal vision, but there's a, a syndrome called Usher syndrome, and it's genetically passed down, and your eyes will deteriorate as you grow older, and you get this tunnel vision, and it, your vision keeps closing in. The peripheral vision is gone until it becomes nothing. And in a short time span, you could lose your, your vision very, it starts off slowly and it can go very fast at, towards the end. Uh, again, you have to learn sign language tactically, learn to read braille and function as a deaf and a blind person at the same time. Hearing loss. This is a way to identify yourself. People say, well, I, I just have a, a hearing loss. You don't say I'm late and deaf or anything like that, but However you want to identify yourself is fine. Um, severe to moderate to profound. You can identify yourself in any of those spectrums. Communication technology. Um, we, we deaf people interact with hearing people all the time to communicate. Some people, will, but hearing people who come to communicate with a deaf person seem to struggle a little bit different because it's different for them. Um, technology has increased immensely um, for us to be able to communicate between both worlds. We can use computers, we use texting on phones. Uh, technology has really advanced to help communication for deaf people all the time. 
Um, we email often. Texting is very popular. So if I meet a here in person, I can just grab my phone and start texting. If I go to a restaurant and I want to order something, I just type something out of my phone and they can read it and my order happens back. If they need anything, they just kind of can type right back. If we can't find a pen and paper at the time, the phone works fantastically as technology has advanced. Um, we also use something called video phones. I can call anywhere. I, same as any here in person using a telephone. A video phone for me works just as well. Oftentimes you'll notice the word hearing person. We use this often. That means they're able to hear and speak. We call those hearing people. And then for deaf and hard of hearing people, we can call them deaf or hard of hearing. That's the way we term those. Next slide. Um, these are just little tips to help you learn how to communicate with a person who maybe has latent hearing loss or any kind of a hearing loss. It's really important to get that person's attention first before you start communicating. If you walk up to them and they are not looking um, and then they turn around to see you, they've missed everything you've said from the beginning. So. Wait till the person turns and you have that um, eye, can, eye, eye contact, then you know you're able to communicate. Again, look directly at the person. Don't look away, um, don't turn your back. They can't see your lips. They're really depending on your facial expression and your lip movement. And your body gestures also help in communicating. Talk. Clearly, speak slowly. And there's a myth out there. When I was a little kid, it happened all the time. I'd meet a hearing person and they'd be like, hey, and I'd be like, and I'm like, hey, and then they start yelling at me. I'm like, why are you yelling? <laughs> I still don't understand you. You know, it, the louder you talk is not gonna help. It kind of makes things worse. And, and it's very difficult to understand somebody when they're yelling. So take your time, make it clear, make communication happen. Again, keep your mouth visible. Some guys with big old beards or mustaches over their lips, <laughs> you can't read, lip read that. Um, if someone is chewing gum at the same time, it, it makes things uh, not clear. Or if they're nervous and chewing on a pencil, it, that's in the mouth. Clear everything away from the mouth so someone would be able to look at your lips and try and understand what you're saying. You can gesture sentences. Facial expression is very important to deaf people. Um, uh, if a boss is talking with a worker, the boss, if they're mad, if they're serious, you can see it on their face. So hearing people depend on tone of voice is how you hear things. If it's a high um, pitch, it's kind of angry. If it's me, middle, um, you can get how people are from the tone of their voice. But facial expression to a deaf person is very important. That's the tone on your voice. If you have no facial expression and you're telling the person they're not doing a good job, the deaf person is gonna think they're doing fine. You have to emphasize that with facial expression where they're like, you have a serious look on your face like, okay, I need to do better or hey, it's a good day. You have a smile on your face. Things are good. We read facial expression a lot. That is the tone of voice for deaf people. If something is not understood, try and rephrase it rather than just repeating the same sentence again and again. It's like, do you have a dime? The word, the sentence is like, do you have a dime? Often deaf people will see that, oh, oh, I have the time, yes, no. Time, dime, they look very same, similar on the fence. Are you gonna repeat that again? Do you have the, a dime? And you'll be like, yes, the time is, rephrase it. Do you have 10 cents? And that person's like, oh, sure, here, I can lend you a dime. 10 cents, it's just a different way to rephrase the same sentence. Because sometimes words look very similar coming off the lips. So 
think about that if you are trying to communicate with someone with a hearing loss and is struggling with that. Don't be embarrassed to talk on a piece of paper with a pen, you know? Communication, everybody wants communication. And however it happens, make it happen. You can type things out, you can text back and forth. There's no embarrassment to try to communicate with somebody. Reach out and try and talk with somebody. And you can go again. Again. Encourage people to ask questions. Make things clear. If you're just sitting there with a mad look on your face and you're just talking to somebody, it's scary. You know, you don't want to ask a question. Often deaf people feel um, hesitant to ask a question. Encourage them to ask. If communication is not happening and they want to clarify something, say, hey, ask, stop and stop me, ask a question, raise your hand, whatever you do, because if I'm not understanding, communication is not happening. So keep that openness for communication. There's something called CART reporting, um, where it kind of, you see that in the courtroom, someone will type something out and it's, um, brought, you can broadcast it up on a wall so everybody can see it. And they just listen, and it helps everybody out in the whole room for equal access. You know, treat people how you want to be treated. Don't think a deaf person is lower functioning or anything like that. We're all human. We're all on an equal level. Don't have sympathy or pity for somebody. It's like, oh, those poor deaf people. We don't want that. We are just the same as you. Deaf people can do anything a hearing person can do. It's just a mutual respect kind of thing. Deaf people really appreciate that a lot. I said, we said again, keep your mouth visible. Um, with big beards or chewing gum, you know, or smoking cigarettes, or you have a pencil or something in your mouth at the time, keep your mouth visible for communication. Um, six to nine feet, that's a usually comfortable bubble for uh, American society. And then, but if you get too close, you will kind of go cross-eyed if someone's trying to move up into your bubble. Or with sign language, you have to keep your distance because you'll get punched in the face. It's a dangerous language if you're too close. It's American culture always has a comfortable bubble they keep around them. Um, going too far of a distance, it makes you going to have to learn to sign bigger or something like that. I'm telling you, three to six feet is usually a comfort zone for everybody. And in communicating, um, if there's deaf people and hearing people all involved in a conversation, um, the deaf person is not going to know which way to look at the table and the interpreter is going to go crazy with several people talking over each other. The thing with that is one person talk at a time. Take turns, give the interpreter a chance to catch up and work with the whole room of deaf people, uh, of hearing people with a deaf person involved. It will make the meeting run a lot smoother. It'll make everybody be able to understand and everybody will keep up with it because it's a very big frustration for um, trying to stay in a uh, busy room with everybody talking at the same time. Um, we use emails quite often, you know, um, it's put deaf people on the same terms as any hearing person. It's made communication accessible for everybody. For us, emails has been the answer that is just um, the technology that has saved us and brought us into the hearing society as an equal. Everybody communicates with their own way. Some people will speak, some will lip read, some will pen and paper, some use interpreters, some just use sign language. Uh, just obey, I mean, whatever they want, accept that. Uh, push again. Be pretty flexible on let the person sit with a hearing loss where they prefer to sit. 
deaf people will, in a, with a hearing group around them in a meeting, they kind of like to be in the middle where they can look back and forth and be able to watch everybody. In a large auditorium and there's a speaker up front, the deaf, let the deaf person sit in the front rows. They prefer that. That way they can look at the interpreter and the speaker at the same time. Um, it just makes uh, the communication easy, easy for everybody. If you have a deaf person sit in the back of many in a long stream a row of seats, um, the, there, there's not a visual um, way to see it. You want to keep the the the, the you want to keep the sight clear for the deaf person to be able to see the interpreter and the speaker. Oftentimes you'll see a pause or something like that. The interpreter is trying to catch up with my, my American Sign Language, changing it from one language to another. So there are short pauses in here, I apologize. Um, don't block um, the communication. If, you're, if two people are talking in sign language and you're walking by, keep walking by. Um, don't stand in between, just walk through. You don't have to duck underneath, just walk through normally. Um, it, you just don't want to block the communication, that's all. Are you good? Lights are very important to deaf people or someone with hearing loss. In a dim lit room, um, it, it would not work. We really depend, deaf people who use sign language, um, it, it just doesn't work in a dim lit room. Keep the well, room well lit. Like for example, this room is finely accommodated. I think the interpreter can see everything I'm saying. Uh, he seems to be staying up on that. The importance is to have a good lit room. Um, helps with for understanding better. Um, do not stand right in front of a, a window and present because you're gonna look like a silhouette is what you're gonna look like, is all it's gonna look. Um, you're not gonna be able to understand because you're being backlit. So step away from a bright lit window and then um, very so much easier to see in a well lit room also. Um, if you give some time, if you show a PowerPoint or something or any kind of thing, let the people read that before you start speaking. Um, that happened to me in junior high school is the teacher would put up a list of things and the interpreter, I'm trying to watch the interpreter and look at what they're talking about on their list also. If I could just take the time, give me the time to read it and then go on and explain, I can watch the interpreter and be able to follow along with the presentation very easily. The thing is, oh, um, forget it. It was no big deal. I'll tell you later. Deaf people feel that is such a huge insult. You know, um, people will say, um, uh, they're talking around a table and you're like, what'd they say, what'd they say? Well, hold on, hold on, I'll tell you later. Or, oh, don't worry, it wasn't important. Make us part of that conversation. Like in a family, my wife, um, we go over to her family and they're hearing. And they're talking around the table and they're laughing and stuff. And they're like, well, what'd they say? They're like, hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, and the conversation goes on and then they finally like, they give us, and I'm like, okay, what'd they say? And they give us like two sentences. I'm like, that conversation went on for five minutes. We missed that whole storytelling. Like if someone's telling, I caught this huge fish. It was, a, it was the biggest catch I ever caught. It was amazing. And the whole trip was amazing with the friends. And you're like, well, what'd they say? And they come back with, oh, he caught a fish. You know, that just leaves people out. It's kind of rude to the people. Include them and give them the full part of the conversation. Ask a person, how do you can make the communication better? You know, maybe they'll say, hey, just use pen and paper or um, just speak slowly or something like that. Um, don't assume that they can read lips or can understand you. Every individual is different. No one's the same. Some people can read lips very well. Other people, it's a very hard skill to learn. 
And so myself, I read libs very little bit. I mean, I could say I can catch probably about 5%. I can get the numbers one, two, three, four, five, or good and thank you, those kinds of things. If someone says a complete sentence to me, I can't understand it. I have not I don't have that ability to lip lip read like that. So ask the person themselves how it's best to communicate with them. How we get attention. How would you get someone's attention who has a hearing loss? Hmm. Uh -huh. You could talk to them, but talking to a deaf person, behind a deaf person, is not going to help. So you can come up and tap them on the shoulder, lightly. It's just a nice tap on the shoulder. You don't dig your hands into them trying to get them, because if you do that, they're thinking an emergency is happening if someone is trying to get their attention that fast. It's a nice light tap, just a quick light tap. Not too light where it gets creepy or anything like that, you know, it's like, are you flirting or what is this? A nice tap would work very well to get somebody's attention. Um, you can come up and shake their shoulder. If it is an emergency, tap harder and it gets somebody's attention very, very fast. If there's a fire or a fire alarm or fire drills happening like that, going up and tap a little bit harder. Again, don't be trying to knock this person down with a tap on the shoulder. It's just a, a forceful tap. Don't hit them in the head. Don't try and tap them on their knees or go down to their feet or like, again, boundaries. The tap on the shoulder in deaf culture is very, very acceptable. You can tap the arm sometimes if you're like right next to them. It's not crossing the line. Clapping or snapping to a deaf person is feels like I'm a dog, you know? It's like, why are you trying to get my attention this way? You can wave your hand easily. I will explain that in a minute here. Next slide. A wave is a visual way of getting someone's attention. Um, kind of like if you're in front of them, not like right in their face or anything like that, standing in their face. If standing back a little ways or if you're on the side of somebody, um, deaf people have very acute peripheral vision. If something moves on the periphery, they'll look. Um, hearing people with you using peripheral vision doesn't work so well. They don't use it as much as deaf people do. Deaf people are very keen to per with their peripheral vision. Um, using your hand, waving it like this, not like this. It looks like an emergency is happening or something like that. A short little wave of the arm works very, very well. Again, a few feet away, not right in a person's face. Next slide. And next slide, we'd explain that one. Don't wave behind somebody's back. A deaf person is not going to see. They don't have eyes in the back of their head, no matter what their moms say. They don't have eyes in the back of their head. Um, you want to wave it in their front and peripheral vision. Wait for a couple seconds to get that person's attention. If they're looking down, they might see it and say, hold on just a second and look up. So give a little bit of time with that. Next slide. Um, I, I mean, be careful of waving really big. You could be take somebody out next to you. So keep your waves just short in front of you. It's just a visual attention getter. Um, deaf people do stamp on the floor. It works many times. It kind of depends on the floor itself and where you are. Next slide. If it's a hard wooden floor, you can step on it lightly and those vibrations go right through the floor. A deaf person, you can get a deaf person's attention very easily. Next slide. If it's a thick carpet, and you're trying to stamp on that, it's not gonna work. It dulls the, the vibration, it will not work. Probably not, you probably have to go up and tap the person on the shoulder. Stamping loudly, if you're in a classroom or a library or a hospital, is a no-no. These are quiet places, you don't want that unnecessary sound. So go up to the person, tap them on the shoulder, the proper way to get an attention there. Sometimes, to get a deaf person's attention, 
deaf people all use this often, they'll flip the lights on and off. And it gets a deaf person's attention very easily. It works every time. Um, it, it, it works like most every time for a deaf person flipping the lights. Now when you do flash lights, it's on and off quickly. It's not like turn them off, turn them back on. No, deaf person would think, what the heck is going on? Is something wrong? Is the power going out or something like that? So um, that's the kind of thing that happens. So just a quick flash of lights works very well. Um, if you're gonna put a deaf person in the dark, it just makes no sense at all. So again, flash the lights quickly. Don't do that in a classroom. Um, but it, it kind of, it doesn't work in a library, um, in a courthouse, of course not. You're not going to flash the lights on and off in there. That's just not the proper setting to do something like that. Go up again and just tap the person on the shoulder or give a hand wave to get the peripheral vision attention would work very well. Now we're going to get into a little bit of technology. Uh, we talked about TTYs. A long time ago, we used these. Um, it, it was, but it was a very popular use for deaf people to use TTYs. A long time ago, in the 70s, um, my parents had one. And it was this huge monster of a machine. It just hummed. It was loud. You typed and you could feel it through the ground. It, it had paper that came out of it. We loved to be able to use the phone using TTYs. I could call my friends on the other side of town, on the other side of the U.S. Uh, we'd go 30, 45 minutes, hours times talking with each other on this teletypewriter. And deaf people were very isolated. We couldn't use a phone before this time. You'd have to meet a person face to face. So opening the phones was incredible. Before that, my parents would have to go... Um, over to somebody's house to see if they're there. They knock on the door, no one's home, and then you had to drive all the way back home. With TTY's invention, you can call, hey, are you home? And tell them, I'm on my way over, and it worked very well. So TTY's really helped deaf people a lot, open up the phones. Now, technology today is we use video phones. The TTY's have pretty much gone the way of a dinosaur. Um, because we had to, it was, typing in English where we had to do TTYs. It was just typing on a typewriter. Now we have video phones where we could use our first language, American Sign Language. It works very, very well. I used to work at a school for the deaf and we had TTYs a long time ago. And people would say, if you wanted to order a pizza, um, they'd be like, how do you spell the word pepperoni? Kids had a hard time with that. So you have to stand there and say, P E P E R O -E, all that and stuff like that. And now we can use our first language with sign language. We use a sign and we give it to the interpreter who then interprets it into English for the person on the end the end who's taking the order for the pizza. Um, you could do doctor visits, lawyer calls, anything. It's so much easier today to use a telephone. We use in video phones for deaf people. Now alarm clocks. Um, can deaf people wake up in the morning? How do they wake up? Of course we can. You, you know how we do it? We connect it to a vibrator or you can plug it into a light. Some deaf people, some people like to get shaken awake. Me, I prefer, I have a light that goes on. I'm very, very sensitive. I don't like waking up to an earthquake every morning. I much prefer to wake up to a nice sunrise in the morning with a light coming on. The doorbells at the house is another thing we use. It used to be difficult. Today, things are so much better. We have lights that flash. And my parents, they connected lights all over the house. Um, we had a light for the phone. We had a light for the doorbell. And you could tell which one was which. One would go slow, one would go faster. If it was a fast light, it was a doorbell. If it was a slow ring, we knew it was a phone. But now, with text messaging, people we know they're coming over, someone's at the door, um, they can say, hey, I text you, I'm here, and you just run up to the door and say, come on in, and stuff like that. It used to be before texting, we didn't have that. We'd hit doorbells and lights would be flashing all over the, ho all over the um, house. And we also have smoke alarms. Um, those are light uh, visual 
devices to. Um, captions and captels. Um, we use closed captions for TV on the TV. Um, if you're in the court, someone is doing cart reporting and um, you could see what is being said. So a deaf person who's going through a legal case can depend on the cart to understand what is going on during the trial. And also they can use interpreters. Sometimes things go so fast in a courtroom, it's overwhelming for a deaf person to see what the interpreter is saying. And if you miss something, you can go back and look up at the cart, um, what is going on, what is being projected on the wall and um, catch up what the important words or what you missed. Because these are very important things happening in the courtroom. Um, um, if you look over and like, what was that? And everybody could look back to the cart. It's, a, the, it's the record of the courtroom and you can see what was said and everyone can refer back to that also. So cart works very well in the courtrooms for many things. You can use hearing aids. There's cochlear implants. It used to be hearing aids would help people just hear better. Um, was it perfect? Would you become hearing if you used a hearing aid? No, not at all. Hearing aids just amplify the sound, that's all. It helps some people and other people, it did not, it does not. Now cochlear implants today is becoming very, very common to see. And someone with an implant, um, they do not become hearing with that. Once you take that, that uh, cochlear implant off or a hearing aid off, you're back to being deaf or hard of hearing. They, they are devices that do help people hear. Um, the cochlear implant is a surgery where they're gonna open up your skull and put a, a computer device into your head that's gonna help you hear. It bypasses the whole middle ear part. Um, cell phones, oh my gosh, they're American as American be, and deaf people use cell phones a lot. Helps deaf people immensely. There's different apps out there. Um, there's websites, there's apps, there's all kinds of iPhones and all different kinds of phones out there. Um, internet information is there and it's in everyone's hands, the same as it is deaf people's. Same along with tablets, computers, emails and such. Um, I could talk with another person who knows nothing about sign language with a tablet, just type things out and we communicate back and forth. Like in HR, um, I applied for a job, it was last minute. Um, they wouldn't provide an interpreter or couldn't get an interpreter. We did the interview just with a laptop. It was no problem with me. I had no problem with it, it was fine. Other deaf people prefer to have an interpreter so they're not struggling with the English as much. But for me, I'm well versed in English and uh, it worked out very well. So this is a list of resources, different links you could look into to find information out there. The Association for Late Deaf and Adults is a great place to see. Lots of information for you. Um, they talk to people who have the similar kind of problems and you get to meet other people who are like you and you could talk about your frustrations and your experiences and how you deal with things because hearing, losing your hearing is a difficult matter. People think, oh, I'm losing my hearing, it's no big deal, but it's tough. It could be grieving to some, some people. So it's a good way to get in touch with people with the same kind of um, problems you're having. Um, hearing Loss Association of America is another thing. Um, they work with deaf and hard of hearing people. Um, deaf and people, uh, communication tips are out there. It tells you how to use pen and paper or ASL. And then Snap Guide, uh, it's a place I haven't used much. And then Assistive Technology of Alaska, ATLA. Um, Atla, yeah, Atla, Assistant Level Technology of Alaska. It's a great place to go here um, for people with any kind of a hearing loss. Um, they have all kinds of assistive um, technologies there. Uh, anything, it's run through the state. Uh, if you're low income, they lend things to people free of charge. 
a statewide, they have many, many, many things for people. I can't say good enough good things about ATLA. For someone with a hearing loss, they have tools to expand a newspaper or a printing, to make fonts bigger. Um, there's lots of stuff out there for people in the state of Alaska. Um, and latent deaf adults information, again, that's for people who have lost their hearing later on in life and trying to deal with things. And so, if you guys have any questions, you can contact me through email. That would be fine. Um, I'm Rudy Kerr. Um, my email address is r-k-e-e-r -E -E at w-b-s dot org. Please feel free to contact me anytime. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day. Bye-bye.